thousand dollars from the Community Development Law Grant from the New Hampshire Community Development Finance Authority to explore the feasibility of a cultural art center to be located in the Littleton Opera House. And I will turn this over to Andrew. Okay. So, uh, just wanted to briefly say that we received, we did receive the twelve thousand dollars through the Community Development Law Grant. Um, we've also received an additional five thousand dollars of grant funds through NCIC's uh, program that they were awarded from USDA CFTAT. Caitlin's here; she could explain that if uh, there's any questions. Uh, we went through a, a competitive uh, process to select an architect and work with the Cultural Arts uh, Commission, uh, the local cultural arts group, to uh, work through uh, some concepts uh, and a plan for for the lower level of the upper house, we always call it the top street level. Andrew, can you speak out, huh? Can you get back here? Yeah. Between the masks and the big rooms, Yeah, we probably should shut this off, too, but I don't know. Okay, yeah. It's not a system in here. Yeah, there's a couple of people do that. I don't know how to do that. That was great. That was shut. So, like, I'll just kind of talk this way a little bit, yeah. best I can. <clears throat> yes, we went through, we were funded this project through uh, two grant sources. Community Development Block Grant for $12,000 and $5,000 through the NCIC's USDA CFTAT program. I went through a competitive bidding process uh, and reviewed architects, selected uh, Dennis Myers Architects, uh, which our contract with Dennis will conclude over probably the next month. Uh, we worked with the Littleton, the select board created a uh, cultural. Oh, okay. Might be done by then. I'll hand it over. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <clears throat> Working with the, the Littleton the Select Board uh, Commission called the Cultural Arts Commission. It's on, yeah. She's working on <clears throat> And uh, our contract with Dennis will uh, probably expire within the next month. And uh, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Dennis and his uh, colleague here to do a presentation. I think she's still turning it on. Did you try it? Is it on now? This is on. Are you passing it? Can you show the air ring? Yeah. Can you turn off the light? Yeah. 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 Street 
floor plan. Uh, as you know, uh, we have the existing conditions. This is the existing conditions plan. As you can see, there are some masonry walls that still exist down there. The elevator continues down from where it is today, and we have the two egress stairwells at the south side of the building. It's mostly open with columns. Some columns are new, most of them are old and may be reinforced. And there's a number of uh, infrastructure piping, conduits, some uh, plumbing pipes, and some other things that we've indicated by where they come down and the columns and so on. So we really have uh, a pretty clean slate to develop the program. So we met with the committee over a number of months and developed the proposed plan, which really uh, enhances the entrance off of Potter Street in the lower left-hand corner with a weather vestibule. And as you enter, you are uh, look directly into the lounge where we have a bar, uh, which is used for catering, which is used to support pre-function meetings that uh, will happen in our multi-purpose space, the big box behind the bar. We're also anticipating opening up the uh, south wall and uh, providing a deck so you can take advantage of the river and the south sun that uh, is so nice during the day. Uh, so the primary uh, multi-purpose space we have is the big rectangular box in the middle of the building. It's uh, designed to accept small performances, a comedian, a small music group, it can seat approximately 75 people in a theatrical or uh, audience facing the front kind of uh, configuration. It can take tables and chairs. You might have a group of 45 to 50 in tables and chairs for uh, more of a community meeting or a breakout meeting or a corporate kind of meeting. Uh, so the idea was that it could also be an art gallery uh, and the walls are set up for display. The lighting is anticipated to light the walls as well as provide the uh, theater light bars for the front of the hall. Behind it there's a green room with some uh, uh, sink support for the uh, performers. Big storage space on the right for the tables and chairs. They'll be uh, put away when there's a standing room only or an art gallery situation. Then we have a number of multi-purpose rooms. The one on the right here, well, let's go back to the entry. Immediately when you come into the entry, right to the left, is a glass corner for a room we're calling the broadcast room. We've had a lot of discussions with the local radio station and they won't abandon the site they're in, but they really see an opportunity to bring the broadcast piece over here, as well as a multi-purpose room behind it, where they can record and interview people and bands that might be passing through and be able to set it up very quickly. Uh, they'll also, when they have more of a scheduled situation, be able to uh, record the performers in the multi-purpose room. We're also looking at having them pick up sort of the access and provide the access TV aspect, which would also be able to be filmed in the multi purpose room behind the recording studio. And you see there's a uh, soundproof glass between the two rooms, so they could be observing the performance and uh, recording at the same time. Toilet rooms are there to support the program, and we have another entrance to the multi this room immediately off the elevator because not all folks will be coming in from Connor Street and we want to be able to provide things that support this larger hall. We anticipate a pre-function reception that happened down there or a program that actually happens up here or it could be an after uh, event program where you retire downstairs 
could be catered and uh, set up with the bar there. Uh, so we see a lot of multi-purpose activities going on here. And that will enhance the ones you already have uh, for the rest of the building. Let's just walk upstairs. The kitchen on the other side is an idea we're still uh, testing in terms of its viability. But there's been a lot of interest to provide a uh, community kitchen that will support our farmers market participants and help them grow their business and uh, be able to market their products. So this is anticipated to be set up as a uh, real commercial USDA approved kind of kitchen. But we're still sort of uh, testing the uh, market and confirming the viability. So as we budgeted this thing, we built in some infrastructure, but the, there are a number of issues that we've identified as uh, ad alternates, depending on how we see the market shaping up. But we'll quickly look upstairs and just remind you that the, this is the floor we're on now with the big multi-purpose auditorium. So this is pretty well spoken for, but the, the green room would uh, remain and the little room where the sink is might also be upgraded to support the uh, performers while the uh, kitchenette and the green room downstairs can do a lot to uh, enable us to maximize the use of these spaces for the performers upstairs. On the next floor, we have a room that it's currently pretty much unfinished on the west wall and we're proposing to use that as another multi-purpose room which could be used for practice by the performers for the big hall here. Could be used as a conference room, a corporate meeting room. And right now there's some exposed uh, mechanicals in there and we're showing sort of drop soffit to hide those and retain the arch windows that look to the west. So let's go down and walk through the model. Uh, these are some elevations of the entry to the building from Cottage Street, and uh, where we show a uh, basically a marquee that uh, shelters the entrance and provides advertising, and then a flat banner that runs up the side of the building since we're sort of on the south entrance to Littleton from the highway. And as you cross the bridge, the idea would be to identify that as a uh, major cultural resource and welcome the visitors to Littleton and the Opera House. We're also showing this uh, deck built out uh, to the south, so you can overlook the river with a small canopy to shelter the doors and pick up some of the articulation of the canopies and the brackets you have on the existing building. Well, let's take a quick walk through the model and try to get a feel for the space we're creating downstairs since the ceiling heights are sort of limited. But we anticipate uh, coming across the bridge and coming into this entry of Cottage Street through the uh, airlock vestibule into the uh, lobby, lounge, reception. So once you come in, you sort of see everything that's available. The broadcast booth to the left, the uh, reception person, or the back wall there would be the activities that are scheduled for the coming weeks, what's currently playing. And then out toward the lounge and the overlook over the river and the deck. So generally the thought is that the ceiling will remain exposed but dark. All the pipes and everything will continue to be up there. The lighting will be largely focused down. And then as we walk out to the uh, deck, we're able to overlook the river. And uh, people coming to town can see the activities that's happening on the deck and even look through those windows and see what's going on inside. We used a little ceiling cloud over the bar to provide the focus and lighting for that area. And then as we go into the multi-purpose room, 
we have the theater lights up towards the front, and all the walls have their individual uh, LED light track lights, and we're just suggesting displays uh, around the perimeter. Maybe we should walk out through the side door. This is the back green room uh, where the fire service entrance is, the electrical service is, and so on. Uh, let's go out by the elevator. So this is the side entrance to the multi-purpose room as you get off our elevator here to the left. And then if we continue, our bathrooms are on the right. And if we go further west to our multi-purpose room, this is where the uh, flexible room is that can support our broadcast studio. And if we, uh, there's our window where the uh, sound board will be on the other side. And then our broadcast studio will be a person behind the window most times of the day and, and welcome the teenagers that come by after school and hang out and do their homework or whatever. So what do we have for pictures? Do we, do we want to show someone else? So this is sort of the view we see, uh, let's see, when was this? In the middle of summer in July or something, we're trying to get the right set of lighting. There we go. So this is coming in from the south. Actually, this is one where uh, our ad alternates. Let's see, let's look at the, the animated picture. And then we'll come back to this. Here we go. So this is when we come in the entry. And this may not be the actual final colors or anything, but they're used to sort of show the volumes and so on in this particular picture, but this is the little reception ticket booth, whatever, with the list of activities on that back wall where those geometric shapes are in this picture. But you can almost, you know, have these windows sucking into the lobby and the deck and so on, so that it becomes a real active kind of space. This is looking through our window from the broadcast booth to the multi-purpose room behind it. And this is a multi-purpose room with a lot of multi-purpose things going on in there. <laughs> uh, just to give you an idea of uh, how things might work. Uh, so then we've done the budget. So one of the things we're doing is we're continuing to negotiate to negotiate with the uh, State Historic Preservation Officer. As most of you know, this building has historic easements both inside and outside. And uh, so we're continuing to work with them on the details and how some of the, these new windows to the south are going to be articulated. We're also working with them on the, on the deck and just what, how that can happen. But we've set up the design and the budget to uh, build that deck independent of the building. It could, and so if it had to be removed at some point in the future, it could. And the same is true of the marquee and the, and the uh, banner side. So we've developed the budget. We're cutting off the left side a little bit. But in any case, uh, we developed a construction budget working with uh, on a page and stone with the construction manager to develop the base bid. The base bid is all the interior work you saw on the Cottage Street level with some of the infrastructure to support these alternatives. One alternative is developing the kitchen to its full extent. The other is the exterior deck. The other is uh, just finishing and the upstairs multi-purpose room that we uh, identified. And then the marquee and the blade allowance 
So those are the construction numbers, and to that, we've added an owner's contingency at this point in the project because we're not sure when we'll go get this thing. And uh, there'll be some refinements as we go from these conceptual drawings to construction documents. There's uh, architectural and engineering fees to take this uh, concept to construction documents from which you can build that would have the detailed structural, mechanical, and architectural documents developed in detail. There's an FF&E allowance. FF&E is fixtures, furniture, and equipment. This is the loose stuff that we anticipate, the tables and chairs, the uh, uh, signage, the actual signage that goes on the marquee and so on, which is why you see a larger number for that over in the uh, marquee column. And then there's some expenses it takes to do some testing, during, independent testing during construction and things like that for a total project cost. So if we were to look at the base building, the total project cost is somewhere near 1.7. And if we add all the alternates, we're up about 2.4. These are preliminary budgets. They haven't been fully defined, but I think they're realistic for the scope we're anticipating, uh, considering uh, the other issues we add to the hard construction number to develop the total project cost. So we have a couple of views of the uh, building without some of these ad alternates and, and those form the basis for uh, helping us budget those issues. So this is the building with the openings in the wall but no deck and no marquee and no uh, blade sign. And there's a uh, various combinations of those. We could do the deck, we could do no marquee, we could do the marquee, and the deck, no blade sign. And so we're looking at those alternatives and using these images and other alternatives to complete the negotiation with the Historic Preservation Officer. So I think I've taken more time than I was allowed, but if there are any questions, I'd be glad to answer them. But it's a progress report from our end, and we're excited about its potential. Anything else, Andrew? I don't know, just maybe if there's any questions. Dennis, I do, you probably said it, but um, just for my understanding, there are two forms of egress. One of them would be the deck, and then one of them would be at the cottage street level. We're yeah. talking minus the, um, the uh, elevator. Is that correct? Right. All right, and what is the total space? You said in one room was rated for 75 people. Is that maximum for the whole space? Or just so that one? The whole space can take approximately, it's about 150. 150. Everything was still. Okay. Good, thank you. Are there any other? Any other questions for the uh, gentleman over here? Okay. Where did the money come from? Uh, Caitlin from NCIC is here, and okay. I don't know if it would be you know, premature to talk about some of the uh, alternative funding sources that would be that could be pursued. Okay. Yeah. Let's see if there's anything else in particular to the structure or the design or whatever, and then we can jump to the financing. That way we could answer. Um, <coughs> would that be okay? Any other questions for the design, structure, okay? What are the um, questionable things about the community kitchen, uh, would you say, specifically? Uh, you can you hear me? I can't. Sorry. 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 Um, what are some of the questionable uh, constituents for the commercial kitchen um, that, that you're not sure of? The, the question was regarding, you know, what are uh, some of the things we want to confirm to uh, be sure the kitchen happens. Yeah. Is that fair? The kitchen is a pretty significant investment, and we're just trying to be sure there's a market for the investment. 
and there's a lot of interest on the part of uh, a number of the uh, farmers market folks. Uh, but uh, we seem to see some other venues that are being used, and we just want to be sure there's enough uh, sustainability there. Yes. And maybe, you know, a factor being alternate that could be fit out later in the process once the we get a feel for how the whole building's working, how the rest of the pool is working. And, uh, you know, you have a good manager of the building and the scheduling and all of those things. Uh, so we're just trying to, we've done some, uh, you know, informal surveys and talked to uh, a number of people that uh, participate in the farmer's market. And there may be other aspects. It will certainly serve as catering to do a lot of other things. But, uh, you know, the viability of that is the thing that isn't fully confirmed at the moment. But it's certainly possible and it could happen in over time. And Dennis, if I can just um, say, we've already had calls at the office um, for people who now do their businesses from their home. They're, they're making cupcakes, they're making candy, and they are interested in using this space. So it would be like a community kitchen. It wouldn't be just be for the farmer's market. It would be for anyone that has a home business that has you know, increased in volume, and we could offer this for rent to those people. And if I can add to that, um, as being on the board of the food co-op in town here, one of the things that we um, is that the local market has done so well through this COVID uh, time. So, you know, investing in those people and their work at home um, is going to be important, I think. Yeah. And we, we talked about trying to do a commercial kitchen in the space that we put the prep kitchen in, and we couldn't do it there. So, in order to market this more for venue use, you really do need a commercial kitchen. Um, you know, the prep kitchen has worked because some caterers will bring in their warming ovens and things like that, but the majority of people want to have a kitchen. And um, so that's another point that could be added to a contract for a price of rental. You know, if you're going to use the kitchen, then this is the price for that. Um, so there's a lot of um, possibilities for revenue for the Opera House. And if anybody at any time, I don't know if this is okay with Andrew and um, Carrie, but if anybody wanted to go downstairs and view that floor, Adam, the new manager, and myself, I'll be hanging around a little bit, um, would be willing to give you a tour of that floor. Any other questions as far as, uh, is this finance related, Bruce, or building related? Or? Okay. Great. Yeah. One, I ask where the money comes from. That will be one. Second thing on it is what I'm hearing and what you're doing in here could be in competition with other buildings we have for other businesses in town. I think you've got a food at this town doing it. Is it you as a private company that's doing it? Are you going to be able to pay the rent? Or are we in competition where we're putting our other little local shops out? Uh, I think there's a lot more to this that you need to ask a lot of questions on rather than just coming up with a, this is a grandiose, nice thing to do. It. But when you've got other people that are trying to make a living around here, you've got to take that into consideration. That's number one. Second thing is I'm asking where the money is. Okay, we're gonna well we're gonna get to that. Caitlin is here and she's gonna address that, Bruce. And, and you, Bruce, I can answer a little bit of that question as far as um, harming any other business that has this type of um, service available. Um, just from talking to people, um, there is no other service for like a community kitchen. Um, we want to help the small business people too, um, and the farmers from the farmers market. Um, anyone who is looking for, you know, have, has a home business, but looking for a space where they can produce their product. And we also, in that respect, can gain more revenue for the office. 
it's, it's a, you know, it helps everyone, really. That's my opinion. Yeah. <laughs> and if I can add to that too, the North Country Consortium was talking about um, wanting to do school programs uh, in this cultural arts center, so that's also something that helps the youth and um, give them some activities, something to do up here. Yeah, Caitlin, would you mind just talking about, I mean, we, we usually go after a number of different alternative funding sources for any projects that we do, and NCIC has been a pretty strong partner with us since, uh, I think, 2015. And uh, with Caitlin here, if you don't mind, I mean, uh, I don't know if this is on. Sure, so I'm Caitlin Robinson, I work for Northern Community Corporation. We work with the Toronto So we do have, yeah. Yeah, well, we do have if I'm going to give here. someone one of the mic, I will wipe right. it down. Thank you, Sue. Oh, that's okay. Just be extra careful. Dennis, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I appreciate that. Before we get to some introductions, I do want to give a big shout out to the Hadlock Group um, Insurance for sponsoring the meters so that we can shop without having to pay. 
um, shop on Main Street and Mill Street without having to pay. So big shout out to Havoc with Insurance. Thank you. Thank you. The um, so the next um, order of business is some introductions. We. Chief Michael McQuillan. Uh, Michael McQuillan uh, is a well-educated and highly experienced leader in the fire service that has routine, routinely demonstrated excellence. He has uh, demonstrated a steady history with the London Dairy Fire Department, where he had advanced professionally as Battalion Chief of Operations. In that executive level position, Mike has demonstrated uh, a high level of leadership and management in an administrative role, as well as a keen understanding of those engaged in firefighting and emergency medical service delivery. Uh, this was a long and well vetted process, and I thank the community for its patience in filling this critical position. We're looking forward to continued collaboration for the success of the organization and to support the community. And with that, I hope uh, Chief want to raise your hand. And, um, forward to meeting people and uh, you'll see more of me in the coming months. I'll be out in the community and I encourage if anybody has any questions, concerns, comments, feel free to come to the firehouse, give me a call, email me. I'm going to try to do some cable access events and stuff to get my contact information out there to you, but I'm here to serve you along with the fire rescue department. So thank you. Thank you. Welcome. And also just like to thank uh, Captain Miller and the uh, fire department for, you know, during this time really stepping up and help uh, Keep the transition to keep the fire department going strong while uh, we have full time chief. So, thank you. So, the next is the introduction of our new fleet man, a uh, town fleet mechanic. <laughs> so, we've got the info, our public works director. Longevity on the equipment and updates and everything, so glad to be a part of the 
process here. Welcome. Thank you. And I could just add one thing. This is really a change in the direction in the way that we handle equipment maintenance. Um, it's really the first step in getting into a fleet mechanic program. And really, uh, we need to thank the expertise of Roger uh, Emerson on our board. Really, we, um, uh, he, you know, he, he had the, the insight to take a look at it from a different perspective when the mechanic position came up. And to really look at, you know, how could we start to think about things in a more holistic way. And in doing that, Doug and Roger work together to create this new fleet management role that's uh, more of a, a senior level mechanic. And I think we're already starting to see some uh, pretty impressive uh, results. So, yeah, thank you. Okay, so next is the on-off ramp lighting. Yeah, so, uh, these microphones are taking it up a notch huh, for our Yeah, do you want production. him down? <laughs> Did you want to introduce Adam? Um, yeah, we can introduce Adam um, to while he's here. We've done it at a previous meeting, I believe. But, uh, oh, you did? Okay. Yeah, Adam Sorry. Starts I just on. didn't know. I didn't know if there was more people here that you'd want yeah. to introduce him. Yeah, and Adam's our new opera house manager. Um, as Sue's retiring at the end of this month, she's going to stay on in a operations advisory kind of capacity, I believe. Uh, but Adam it takes over the reins on January 1st, so we're really excited to have him. He comes to us with a background in marketing, events, arts, music, and uh, I think he's going to have a lot to offer for the community. So. Just want to make sure everybody knows he's the new man. <laughs> Very nice to meet everybody. I, I you know we did this once before in the last months, but a lot more faces at this one, so equally nice to meet everybody again. Looking forward to it. Thank you. So on off ramp lighting. So I just briefly uh, talked about this and turn it over to Chief Smith might have a little more to add. Uh, so concerns have been described as a result of a decision by the New Hampshire Department of Transportation to cut expenses by eliminating funding for on and off ramp on and state highway intersections for the lighting. Um, I requested assistance from our local uh, representative slash senator uh, Aaron Hennessy. Uh, she reviewed the possibility uh, with the DOT of potentially uh, re reinstating some of that, those monies into the budget. Um, after my meeting with her a week or so ago, we discovered it was unlikely that a decision was going to be made to put this, these funds back into the budget because it's a statewide decision and they're not going to, uh, they're unlikely to select certain communities that they would put lights back on. There is a safety procedure that that can happen, but again, it's highly unlikely. I don't think it'll meet the state's guidelines for um, the safety uh, review. So after looking at the cost, it looks like the cost is roughly three thousand uh, dollars. This would be to turn on on off ramps, and you know, if you think about intersections like uh, St. Johnsbury Road and North Wilson Road, uh, which are pretty dark. Um, and so, basically, what I'm uh, requesting of the board, would, after Chief gives a little bit of talk, maybe about safety concerns, is just that we would consider putting the roughly three thousand dollars into the proposed budget to uh, for the town to cover the uh, cost of the and water might to turn those lights back on. But uh, Chief Smith, as uh, probably as part of our traffic safety committee, uh, might have some insight into the safety concerns of these locations. I um, I can say that we've received numerous complaints about the on-off ramp, specifically by the hospital. Um, it's dark as a pocket out there, and um, you know people are are not comfortable with it being that dark. I know there are some newer crossings or more uh, efficient crossings uh, at exit 42. Um, and, you know, big picture is the state didn't consider, in my opinion, the safety component of uh, eliminating lighting. It was strictly a budgetary issue. Um, I never saw any data from the state that said what the cone distance was from each light and how one particular light at, a, at what particular location would provide sufficient lighting for the off-ramp. Um, and essentially what the state did is they downshifted the cost to each community and washed their hands of it and said we saved money um, and made it a community decision whether or not 
to uh, illuminate each particular road or off ramp. Uh, unfortunately, there there really isn't a lot of crash data that would that could uh, that I could bring to you to say, hey, we've had an increase of 20% of crashes at these particular locations. It's just it's not part of the the uh, the uniform crash uh, incident report that we fill out that would indicate that these particular locations, lighting was a, a these traffic lights were a specific issue. Um, but I would recommend that you, uh, based on the, the verbal complaints that we've received over the years, that you place that money back into the budget. So, question I have, there are 23 of those between exit 41 and 44. Are we yep. talking about turning them all on and would it be at the cost of 3000 to have them all turned back on? If that was what um, the numbers were given to you by water and light, I would assume, because they're, they're water and light poles, there are poles, if, if I'm not correct, because we've had some knocked down and Littleton Water and Light puts them back up. Okay. Um, but I would assume that... It was, it was under $4,000 for all 23 to be turned back on. Yes. Okay. That's per year. That's up over time. So do we, are you looking for? Yeah, okay. Oh, I'm sorry. You could take that under advice. Bring it up. If it's three or four thousand dollars, how about looking at it? it says, Operate somehow by cutting three or four thousand dollars out of your budget to keep your mother on life. In other words, that's what it says you've got. You've got a lot of things to be in place, a fire, a whole bunch of different things around that you might be able to cut. The town office is in. But I think you should be saying if you're going to put it on here to increase it by three or four thousand, you should be looking to say, Here's what we're going to do, and we're going to cut three or four thousand dollars. Maybe the town manager's salary, I don't know. But consequently, <laughs> something like that, out of it, where you do cut stuff in here to compensate for what you have. And that's what you should be looking for. It's not just increasing expense, and what you should be looking to say, if you're going to do it, and we're going to put it on there, here's how we can do it. We can turn, try to cut it back out of, you know, compensate. I think Chief brings up a good point. What value would you put on the life if there was a crash there and it was a failure? Well, I'm asking the, the value is fine. I'm not arguing that. I'm saying if you if you uh, had something else on you, you cut something off to compensate for it. Cut back. Stop the spending. Littleton's very much into the biggest spending town. Everything you put on here, we seem to have a tendency to spend, spend, spend. And I think you've got to look at it that says, if you're going to put something else on to do it, you look at it that says, what can we take off or how can we compensate for it? Do you have any questions? Roger? Anybody else have any questions, input on that? We'll take that under advisement, Bruce, and, and look into that. Thank you. I just had the Eaton parcel proposals. So, you know, I, I put on here, I know that it was reviewed at the last meeting um, and presented by um, an advisory panel that I had review the proposals come in from myself. And I think at this point, um, just in thinking about the timeline for either town meeting or RSA 4114A, or, um, you know, it's been talked about, you know, potential of establishing some kind of a committee to review the parcel itself and any concepts to move forward and uh, work to do nothing and really just looking for direction as to what the next uh, phase could be for eating parcel. I think that's what we had decided at the last meeting that we would like to put a group together, a committee. Mm -hmm. um, there were a lot of people that had shared uh, concerns at the last meeting, so we thought the best thing to do would be to do that. 
And would it be appropriate to put it out there that if people are interested in being on that committee to uh, write to us? What we could do is, do we could do an announcement like we do for any of the other commissions when there's uh, vacancies and post it up online and try to get it out some papers. And uh, do you have a number in mind? Five, seven? I think it needs to be a pretty good chunk of the community, you know, 10 anyway, just to get both sides of the story. Because I'm kind of new to this, can you please explain to me what this committee is going to be doing? Can you explain that a little bit more? Sure. It'll be um, hopefully made up of many different folks of the community to decide what is the highest and best use of the Eaton property. Does that make sense? Uh-huh. Okay. That's why I'm here. Yeah, good. How many did you say we'd be on the committee? Well, that's what we're trying to decide. It probably would be more than 10 more to be on the committee. Right. And probably what we ought to do is just kind of think that through, because we'd like to have um, even maybe the department heads on there or some input from the abutters, input from the Conservation Commission, maybe input from even developers in the area, but to have a good cross mix of that. Input from all the people that live around there, and most a lot of the people that are here tonight. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Carrie, mm -hmm. I have a question. Huh? Sure. How did it happen that this even came up? Um, I'm asking simply because when Stephanie gave a budget price to the town, so that the land would be owned by the town, not the worst luck, not anybody. Um, she wanted it to be for recreational use. She stood in my garden, which abuts her yard, and she said that it was to be in perpetuity for um, snowmobile trails and hiking trails and stuff. So I guess because I'm kind of a you know, homebody, I haven't heard what is going on that there's this push, you know, I can ask. Um, what is happening that there's this interest in selling it or building it up or anything when it was given to the town for the budget price of $100,000 and it's worth millions? Can you tell me that so I don't feel so in the dark? <laughs> sure, no, it's, and it's a very good question. We and Andrew chime in or Roger, Chad chime in. And do you want to? Sure, I mean, so you know, we, we just looked at it, some of the uh, original documents, and you know, what we could see was that. The parcel was sold to the town, um, what probably was market value at the time, without any deed restrictions on it. Uh, the intention was to, to, for the town to use it as a recreation, um, and I believe it was recreation fields. Uh, it was determined at the time that that's not uh, a viable option, just due to the terrain and location. Um, I think there was some time later, and I'm kind of sum summarizing, uh, it was uh, kind of looked at to be potentially a space for a new school, for a new uh, Lakeway Elementary School. Um, after looking at the site again, the school, uh, whoever else was involved at the time determined that this was not a great location for that either. Um, you know, over the past, and then how, how this came up really, over the past, um, you know, four years, uh, I've been working on commercial development and the planning board and other places, including the recently released master plan. Um, there's been discussion of what to do. What, why aren't we doing meeting the housing crisis? Why aren't we uh, starting to expand housing for folks and doing something? And so, um, another thing, the school uh, brought up at several meetings, um, you know, basically blaming me for not selling the Eaton parcel or coming up with a plan saying the school didn't pass because the town hasn't resolved what to do with the Eaton parcel. So, seeing an opportunity to uh, try to address or at least get a community dialogue going, uh, we created a RFP. Uh, the RFP was built in such a way that a uh, request for proposal. So it was a request for proposal to be submitted by <coughs> potential developers. Um, the, the purpose of the RFP, the way it was drafted, uh, reviewed by the select board and approved for release, was to um, you know, establish a, uh, a process that would start public dialogue, but then also um, enable developers who had the, the, the capacity financially, professionally, and experience to um, 
come in and show a proposal that they could actually commit to. Uh, the benefits of <coughs> parcel or that kind of thing where it's connections to public infrastructure, sewer, water, electricity, roads, also its location, um, and uh, also the ability to generate a significant amount of uh, tax revenue pretty quickly um, and meet the, the housing demand. So once that was put out, we received three bids. Uh, two bids were considered uh, non-responsive, meaning they didn't submit the information that was required, like bank statements and that sort of thing. Uh, one developer submitted a, uh, a proposal that met the requirements, um, was a commitment to purchase and develop. Once that those proposals were in, there's a process that the uh, select board has an option to use, which is RSA 4114A. So already RSA 4114A uh, provides for public dialogue uh, before the sale or purchase of the property. Um, the, the process involves uh, having information presented to the Conservation Commission and Planning Board separately, and then they get to issue opinion letters to the board. Uh, I plan on going to those just to present the information we have, but unfortunately we had some uh, health issues. Um, then after that, and the, if the board chose to go with that process, there's a requirement of two public hearings where the public would be involved in a discussion, and then after that, a separate vote of the board. The town then has the ability to petition the board to include it on a warrant article. Um, but that's basically the, the process of the warrant article. Because it's not anybody's land. If it's given to the town with the idea that the town people could enjoy it. Yeah, it wasn't given. It was, it was purchased, it was purchased at the market market price without any restrictions. The intent, I don't know what the discussions were back then, I know some people know the owner, but it was not relayed in any way in the, in the deed. There's no restrictions that way. Uh -huh. okay. I'll get over here so I can address everybody. Can you hear me in the back? Yes. Can you hear me in the choir? <laughs> I know why a lot of people are here tonight, and it has to do with the Eaton property. And the town manager is very right. When they had Stephanie sell them the land, and she put her signature on it, she had no restrictions on it. That's the legal bottom line. Two weeks ago, we met here and discussed this issue, and in the past two weeks, the Conservation Commission, or some of its members, have met to talk about this and have walked the property. Has anyone else walked the whole property? Has anyone out there walked the whole property? The whole property. Yeah. The whole yes. property. Corner to corner to corner to corner. We've got extremes that where this thing can go. It can go from being left as open space, 103 acres with all the benefits that that might provide, to be dug up and developed with the plan that, was, that possibly can be accepted and all the benefits that that might provide. I've spent my whole life in the forest industry. I came out of the University of Maine in 1969. In fact, one of the, things, one of the classes I took was public speaking. I thought, why am I going to need to take this class? <laughs> and they said there were four S's for public speaking. Stand up. Speak up. I don't want the little boy to get this wrong. Know when to shut up <laughs> and sit down. And sometimes I have a problem with the third one. <clears throat> anyway, we walked the property. So looking at it as a woodlot, 103 acres is not anything too big to be a town forest. You need a certain number of acres unfragmented. And this is what's killing all our open spaces, fragmenting it, taking a little piece here and a little piece there and putting another little suburb in. You need 103 if you're going to see all the dynamics that we saw that other day on Saturday when we walked. We've got stands of oak and beech with tremendous hard mass for the wildlife, the deer sign in that upper back corner behind the Baron Dean's old turkey farm, which is now now the catalog, that catalog is incredible. Uh, 
Once you start breaking that up, the plan called for 35 acres at the top of the piece. Well, I can tell you what's at the top of the piece in the northeast corner. You might float a boat in there, but that's about it. That's why that probably was set aside as that piece. I don't mean some bias, but how can I not? I did a little math on what those buildings are going to be. And if you looked at all those buildings, the numbers of buildings in there. I took an estimate of roof pitches and roof areas and everything. The roof areas on that development, when it's all done, will be 16 acres. That's 12 football fields. Dumping water off. We're now this whole thing, we're, we would be managing as a forest for wildlife, water, recreation, some timber. That whole piece right now is a living sponge, and all the people who live downstream from that on Richmond Street know your backyard's not getting eroded because the trees in the forest are absorbing all that water. Okay. If you use very conservative figures for what they might put for residents into that place, you would come up with 1,500 residents. The population of Little Bend in 1960 was 5,003. The population in 2018, 58 years later, is 5,895. We gave 892 people in 58 years, and we're looking at housing for 1,500 people. So the growth, that was a growth from in 58 years of 18% in town local. And by the way, the last two years, the growth is negative, like negative 1% for the population. 18% in 58 years, that's 0.3% a year. That's about what you might get on a good money market these days. 0.3% a year. If you take the 0.3%, and you look at what they want to increase for population, it comes up 90 years, 90 more years. To get up to that. So I think these, a lot of this information that has come in on this proposal fitted the format. I mean, if you're a smart student, you figure out what your teacher wants for an answer, and that's what you give her. And this developer, Doing his job, did a good job. He filled in all the lines and he showed something that shows a tremendous amount of possible tax revenue coming to this town. If you do your homework, you'll find out that there's different kinds of tax revenue that come to the town. Cost of community services is a huge piece of it. Open land costs you next to nothing. The trees don't send their kids to school. None of that stuff happens. Commercial land is a good deal because it doesn't demand all the personal services that residential does. Residential services, and you can check the figures, the average in the state of New Hampshire, that every dollar that you get in tax revenue, you spend a dollar and fifteen cents. So please, everybody that's interested, meet me at the door on the way out tonight, and I'll give you my dollar, and you give me a dollar fifteen. I'm betting the line won't be very long. We've got many other places in this town with house laws available. Many. And we don't need to build this tremendous amount of infrastructure that's going to require extra community services. You're going to see another policeman, you're going to see another plow truck, you're going to see all these things as you do that. And you're going to take away a piece of land that has been in the same family since 1900 and He's right. The lawyers say, we don't care what that woman wanted. That's the way life is. Well, we all look in the mirror a different way. This woman spent a good deal of her life as a state representative going down to Concord for next to nothing, getting her mileage to help you people in this town. And for those of you who knew her, and met her on the street, she cared about it. And it was her. I don't know whether to call it naivety or what. If she didn't put restrictions in the deed, but she did. But if you look through her paperwork, you'll find that she actually had a little master plan of her own with a forest management plan on it. 
She could have sold this land, no problem, in 1995 to a realtor. She probably come up with a better $113,000. On purpose, she subdivided out a, people, a couple of pieces of land to build houses. That was a development she agreed with. And she gave the first piece of town, over the town, with the wording of the Warren article, she felt was the handshake. Obviously not yet. The wording of the Warren article was recreational uses and municipal uses. So I've been in touch with family members, our cousins and nieces, nephews, passionate about their aunts, values, and feelings. And I'm sure through letters of the editor, nothing could be hearing about that. But for those of you that are here tonight, thank you for coming. And for those of you who I walked through on your backyards the other day on Saturday, I walked by Buck Nelson's out of my other backyards. And you know what's going to happen to value your property or something like this takes place. So from the Conservation Commission point of view, and from being a valued, honored friend of the Eaton family, this is my day. Thank you. We will, thank you for, for sharing that. We will get back uh, as far as the number on the committee. We'll have it posted. But I also, in all fairness, I believe Mr. Um, is it Bonfacci? Is he here tonight? You are. Okay, is there anything, in all fairness, is there anything that you would like to share? Yeah, so um, so, so thank you. Um, so, I mean, we put together a proposal just based off of the master plan that was available online. Um, we, 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 sure. Um, so we put, put together the proposal that was presented based off of the master plan, which is available online. There is a, a need for housing address in the master plan along with the community forest. That was the way we, we, we addressed dividing up the parcel. Um, I, I did, you know, speak to the, you know, reporter at the, at the, at the record, I'm sure a lot of you guys kind of read the article. We, our intention is to put something there that people would want, which is why it was um, created under the, under the direction of what the master plan specified. Um, that was really the, the intent, carving off a longer portion of it to be recreational space along with um, open public space for, for the public to enjoy, and then also uh, attempting to address the, the housing shortage, which which is going on in the town. I understand that the growth hasn't been you know huge over the last 60 years, um, but a lot of it is because uh, a lot of the houses that are being built are, aren't full-time residences. Um, I think there there's probably more growth going on in the backyard than than, than the numbers show just by you know pure residents. Um, and that was one of the things that we believe in. We own a number of units in town. There's a big demand for um, apartments. There's wait lists. There aren't enough apartments for people to live in. There aren't enough apartments for um, the average workforce. Um, we're constantly always having wait lists for the units we do have. And there is a demand in the, in the, in the vicinity for newer apartment buildings that are, are safe for, for families and children, which was one of the things that we were trying to address with, um, with some of the other Um, sixteen percent coverage, which is the, the sixteen acres over hundred. I mean, that's 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 well below a lot of building restrictions and a lot of a lot of towns. Most of the time, you go up to fifty percent on a lot of parcels. So we kept it low on purpose because we we didn't want to overpack the area, but um, but we definitely want to put something there that that benefits the town. Our intention isn't to to put something there that that doesn't benefit. Great, thank you. No problem. Appreciate you sharing. So we will we'll get that up on the um, on the internet. Bruce. Yeah. Yeah. So, you have a mic. Yeah.
this train uh, in the suite, private trains to get. They get 45 house lots. The Greenwood property's got 50 house lots. Uh, Grimmar Terrace has got 11. Uh, the Dodge Boys has got a couple. Um, the other one is uh, David McCoy. He's got 12 lots available. So there's plenty of housing availability on that path. I also didn't think you guys did a very good job looking into it. To give you an example, when it was constructed up there or purchased, the logger built a road up in there, and right away it went to the other piece of property that's town. You didn't mention that at all. You don't know a lot of what's going on in some So I think it's wrong. I think that the article I read in the paper on it as a contractor, I think you don't understand that you might have read what's going on. But that is no R1. Okay? You can't put in those storage units and different things like that. See, you can't do that. It's not zoned for that type of stuff. So what you're coming up with. The other part of it is you don't have water pressure enough to be able to take care of what you've got. Your article you put in the paper was not a very good article to be able to figure out what you're going to do as a community. The other part is I agree with the fact that you have a committee. You, it's very close to town meeting and you shouldn't be jumping the gun. Get your 10 people together, come back with some concepts and some ideas pertaining to what you're dealing with. Look at it and see what you're going to do after you get 10 people to get together to make some kind of rational decisions on what you're talking about. But you also can take, as a community, takes only 25 people, put an article on there that says that you can use this property for the same thing that Stephanie wanted it for. It certainly wasn't very good advice when she got it from some attorney how to protect the town and power of So all you gotta do is put 25 signatures together and put it out for the long end to make it still become a piece of property that was kept by the town, used for recreational purposes or something like that. I look at different things that the town has that if you wanted to have go out and talk about the word dog pack, like I think it's animal pack. You get use of stuff, things so there's a lot of different uses for things of that nature, and you should retain it. As I said, it's a perfect location to it. And you need it to come beyond my lifetime. If you put something on here that's going to have solo, it's got a beautiful angle for anything that you put in there for solo. And it ain't been very long before you guys are going to be driving electric cars, I'll tell you that. Thank you. Thank you. Please. Thank you. Okay, so the next um, on the agenda is the North Country. Mm -hmm. Going into another hot dog. Sure, can I ask one more question? <laughs> sure. This is my first lovely meeting, so bear with me. I just want to know. I don't need that. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. I just want to know if it takes 25 people to sign a piece of paper that urges the voters to save that land for what Stephanie in spirit, at least, wanted it to be for our town. Why couldn't we, if we have 25 people here, why couldn't we sign that petition now to get it on the article? Because I'm thinking the meeting is coming up soon. Is that something we can do? It has to be drafted properly. Yeah, I don't think we want to rush it for this town meeting. I mean, this, this is a very serious okay. issue. And I think the other could hold true too. There could be 25 voters that actually said we want it developed. Okay. So I think we need to um, get our committee together that okay. just to flush this out. Can we count on you people of not putting it on there? Or is that I, there, there's no way we can. Um, I'm just asking. Right. I'm sure you're going to commit yourself as a group up front and say you're not going to put it on here to be selling the property. We wouldn't pull a fast one. No. Uh, no. Here we go. One. Now we've got two more to come in. Okay. Don't so, plan on putting it on the warrant or selling it anytime soon. No, I don't believe it's for sale right now. 
I think the people ought to have a little more input on what happens to this piece of property. Thank you. If you guys are comfortable, we can create the committee tonight and give them a purpose, or do you want to show on it? I, well, we can create it, um, but I think then we want their input. Who would like to be on it, um, and then kind of... Well, we can create it, but we should probably have a, a mission for the committee. Mm -hmm. So should we wait till the next meeting and... Let's, let's talk about we'll Come that. up with a mission yeah. of, of what we would, you know, like to see come from the... Well, in fairness to the people that live on South Street, they should have a say in what goes on with this rather than just the butters. You know what I'm saying? If you have a committee that you can form with the butters. Um, well, I think it should be a good cross-section of the community, not should, just the butters. Yeah. I mean, they should certainly be represented on that. Any, you know, taxpayers out there. You know, or, we okay with that? Yeah. yeah. All right. We'll be hearing more. I mean, check the website too. Jim? What kind of housing development are they planning to put up there? Is it going to be for welfare recipients or for anybody or for uh, old age? Or what the hell is it going to be? Well, we'll have Mr. Mamachi. <laughs> So, so it wasn't really meant to be any restrictions. So um, the goal would be uh, a condo um, community so that we can provide um, newer construction that's at affordable price for a lot of people that are looking to move into the area. And then also um, some apartment buildings because again, there's, there's a shortage of apartment rentals in the town, which is something that we're very, very close to just because we, we, we do have a number of units in the area. It's not gonna end up being a low income deal? No, nope, there's there's no 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 voucher no subsidiary that is not part of the plan. It's meant to be um, it's meant to be affordable in terms of like not overpriced, not you know driving people out of the area, but it's definitely not meant to be subsidized. And if I could just add, one of the benefits of the town actually owning a parcel and then doing looking at some potential options is that it really does put the town in the driver's seat as far as dictating what kind of development they want by putting any kind of deep restrictions on it. Um, Whereas our zoning is pretty limited in, in uh, Littleton, so if a development comes into another spot, uh, if the town is very limited in what it could uh, ask for or restrict, for example, you know, you could put low income housing just anywhere in the zone that works. Uh, whereas, you know, like I said, something like this, the town retains the ability to demand, you know, look, the kind of lighting or sidewalks or, you know, conservation land, roadway widths, sewer connections. Water, electricity, you, you just get all the control. Thank you. Do you we want to go into the next the North Country Solid Waste Landfill? Yeah. Oh, we, we want to take care of Karen so she has this interview. Karen, she just has a couple of Oh, Karen, yes. Yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> change then? Do we are appointed in treasury? We or? might want to change that to duly elected or appointed. Okay. 
then we're covering both bases. If anything happened, that the treasurer wasn't elected, and you appointed one at some point, it's one, one change down the road. Okay. All right, and then on page two, although it's not labeled page two, it says, the Board of Selectmen hereby authorizes investment of excess and other funds in accordance with, and it gives the RSAs. Where are we investing now? Right now, we have our investments at Bank of New Hampshire. And it's the investments under this policy are only the town, not the trustee, the town buys. Okay. Okay, good. Then on, I think it's page three, it says authorized depositories. Um, Town of Littleton and all revenue received by the Town of Littleton to the Treasurer, the Treasurer shall deposit said funds with one or both of the following institutions. So, and then there's a list of, but it says with one or both. There's more than two. Um, there, so should it say more, uh, one, one or more. more than two? How about one or more? One or more. Okay, I feel better with that. Okay, and then the treasurer on an annual basis shall obtain a statement of condition from each bank where the treasurer deposits or invests funds. Have we been getting these? We've been getting those. Okay. Actually, we get a statement on a um, almost daily basis okay. of our funds, with the big funds that we have with Bank of New Okay, good. That's, that's all I have. Do you um, Roger, Jen? So then I'll make a motion that we approve the investment policy as amended. I'll second. Any all in favor say aye. Aye. Okay. Ready? Karen. I think you're the bonding company first. What'd you say, Bruce? I think you need to check with your bonding company first. The treasurers are required under the law to be bonded. And before you change any policies, you should be checking with the bonding company, the bond town, and the treasurer, and anybody else before you make any decision. We can check that. I mean, basically, it's just the date, but it's just a change in very uh, minute verbiage. It doesn't but make any difference. We'll verbiage check. is what I'm trying to get at, and what you're doing. You check with your bonding company before you go and vote. That's These, what you do. That's what a bond the financial is. financial institutions that we usually put funds in, that we do put funds in, end up being uh, governed by the New Hampshire state, and they have to follow certain rules, and they are bonded institutions. I didn't say that. The treasurer, in turn, is required by law to be bonded in the state of in, in every treasurer in every town. She is bonded. And she is bonded. But before you change any wording of what you do, you check with a bonding company before you make any changes to make sure it's done correctly. We will. You not not will. They want to vote on it. So what I'm saying is you do it. This is a, a policy that's been in effect and approved by the auditors for over 10 years and it needs to be looked at annually. <coughs> One meeting is going to make a difference. If you go back and check with the bond company to make sure that it's correct as to what you're doing and the wording that you use. That's all you ask for is to do it that way. What are the consequences if we don't vote on it tonight, Karen? Nothing. Okay. So let's bring it back to the next meeting and we'll check with our bonding um, and make yeah. sure that it all right, no, no big deal, as long as there are no consequences. Yeah, nothing. Thank you, Bruce. All right, so the next um, is the authorize the treasurer to transfer sewer fund accounts to the new bank. Yes. Um, I have here, and I just picked them up, um, some documents from uh, an account that we have. And one is a uh, replacement account. For the last year, we've been charged fees. And our fees are more than what our interest is. So I say, 
it's time to authorize the town manager and the trust, uh, treasurer to move the funds into a financial institution that's going to pay us a little bit of money. I know it's not a big account. Um, we're looking at 35000 but when we're losing $291 and only gaining 176 it's time to look at something else. Then we have a sewer connection account. Similar situation. It is a small amount. It's about $5,800. But we're losing a little bit of money on that. We haven't been charged fees until uh, December 2019. And we started being charged fees. Did you get a reason for it? Um, at that time, we did because of the um, economic and the fact that it costs money to use to set up these bonds. We have, between the trustee accounts and our main accounts, a quite sizable amount. Just in the trustee funds, uh, there's over, and I'm thinking off the top of my head, between school and private trust with the cemeteries and the town trust, it's over $3 million. And then we have our, our regular general fund checking there. And then we have these smaller funds. We're paying fees on these smaller funds. And if we are, let's move them somewhere where we're not paying the fees. We also have a general fund operating small account of $3,773, and that one's also seeing fees on it, costing us $125 a month. It's just crazy. So I'm asking for the selectmen to make a motion, and I wrote the motion on the bottom. If they would authorize, I think you've got two copies there, sorry. Have you done any research yet, Karen, as far as with the other financial institutions, or were you waiting for a response? For waiting us for a response. Um, that's why I tried to uh, write this so that any time from here on out that it's noticed that we're being charged fees and we're not uh, gaining in our accounts, that you authorize the town manager and the treasurer, and I didn't put names with them, to move any non-trustee related funds into any local banks that fit the authorized depositories at any time. And the authorized depositories are described in the investment policy. Question. First of all, you better be looking at You've got only insured up to 250000 of them, no matter what you do. So you should be looking at possibly dividing that up or talking to some banks as to how you insure yourself, because these banks can go down in tubes like nothing flat uh, right at the present time. So you're not doing it correct. The trustees have that in their accounts. That's the what I'm talking about. Whoever's got the accounts, whether it be doggone insured, you're only insured up to $250,000. And you turn around and you put your investments in for protection. The other thing is, you can't add the town manager. He's not bonded. Uh, you have to go with the treasurer to get bonded out of the thing on it, too. But the town manager is not bonded. The reason why I added the town manager as part of this is we should have two people involved in you any have, type of You have a treasurer and you have an assistant treasurer, too. We have a deputy treasurer. I mean, the deputy treasurer, so they take care of it. You don't have the town manager who's not bonded. Those people are bonded. I don't mind either way, but just a correction, I am bonded. You are bonded? Yes. For how much? I can't remember. I, Maybe 10 million. Then. I can get you that information. Yeah, you can get it. I'm also bonded, too. And I can get you that information. So the town runs a bond that cover a lot of different jobs and different things up as far as bonds. But I don't recommend that the town manager is the guy to be doing that type of stuff on. I think we should have a trader 
an assistant treasurer. They're the people who should be in that time. And faculty should be protecting yourselves as far as our community is concerned. Any one of these planning institutions that goes down the two, uh, and, uh, I, all I can think of is the Andrews State Bank down in Manchester with the biggest bank in the state of New Hampshire, and they went down to a few years ago. Why wouldn't you look at it to protect yourself? I haven't seen. I mean, I haven't seen what the funds are in, but they're, and it's probably either an ICS or the collateral line. They are collateralized, they are collateralized. but they're, they're protected. They're protected, yeah. protected in a way where I think deposits happen in, a, in multiple institutions, so that there isn't a, any additional exposure beyond what Bruce is alluding to. That at the IC um, insurance. insurance yeah. Yeah. So I don't need an answer tonight. If you want to wait till the next meeting, that's fine. If you want me to investigate uh, further on the town manager or the deputy treasurer, I can do that too. But I definitely feel there needs to be two people involved. I agree. Can you investigate on the rates that you could find from another? You're waiting for some of that information, correct? Be interested to see that. You bring that with the proposal. Okay. Yeah, that's great. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Karen. And I'm not sure if this will be Karen's last meeting or not. But really, you know, thank her for her 18 years of service as our finance director. Um, we'll have a new finance director to introduce uh, at an upcoming meeting. Um, you know, Karen has been <coughs> available to help make sure we have a smooth transition. But just want to thank Karen. Thank you. Yeah.
One of the things that has come up is, I know, you can only have so many committees, but to put together, again, another group, because Margie um, Seymour also contacted us and said that she, she would be willing to be a part of that. So if we could get a group together, um, that would, because the, is, trash isn't going to go away. And I, and I think we have to come up with something that's going to be sustainable. Well, we could look into more other, other places, such as in success, where you turn key. And I, I'm sorry, but I'll, I'll argue that it has, it has a huge effect on Wilson, in the sense that, I know that, but the wetlands permit that the DES has now wants 26 areas of, uh, worked on because of the effect on the streams and the wetlands complex of the Alder Brook that then goes into the Anamusi River. And our river and our river walk gives us so much economic benefit to this town. So I, I'm sorry, but I maybe legally it doesn't apply. But I I think it does. So would we have enough interest to um, form a North Country Solid Waste Landfill Committee? Um, I didn't say another time. I said approval of any application for another commercial landfill to be built in the North Country. I have nothing to do with Bethlehem Adult, but in the North Country. Right. So I, I beg to differ. <laughs> You know, just say like you know when you're thinking about what you might want the mission to be. Uh, it could we we at the town as far as the power home transfer station, you know, kind of gained this out as like what is the additional cost going to be or what's our solution to uh, transfer station closed. But maybe the city could also just help us explore that further. For what are the long range options? What are we going to be looking at? And is there some kind of ideal participation to put Littleton to play a role in that? I also think your point of trash not going away is valid, a problem, but from what I'm familiar with, it's not even just going to be our trash, which as, as a community member, I'm strictly opposed to. Mm. Good, thank you for sharing that. John? If I may weigh in, um, I'm John Swan, I live in Dalton. Uh, I've been at the heart of this fight against this landfill for a year and a half, and I will just say that the town of Whitefield last year at its uh, town meeting did vote uh, for the town to oppose a non-binding warrant article to write to the governor to say that they were opposed as a town to the creation of a second landfill in the North Country on the Amanusik River. And I think that's the heart of the matter here because the Bethlehem landfill will be closing, uh, whether it's sooner or later. 2026 is when they're scheduled to be done, but their current permit, which was approved in part because of some of what Mr. Dorsett said, these inflated, nonsensical numbers relative to costs, which don't make any sense. And I think the purpose of this committee should be to examine the alternatives for the town of Littleton relative to what happens to your waste. And you already have an existing transfer station. All you need to do is point the trucks from going to Bethlehem to Mount Carberry in success, which is a municipal-owned landfill. It has plenty of capacity. Their current Phase 3A permit that has been submitted to DES, not approved yet, gives them more capacity out to 2041. And there's no reason why they can't accommodate North Country Waste. The town of Dalton made the switch last uh, June and they've already in a head-to-head -head comparison with what they're spending at NCES because of lower tipping fees have saved over a thousand dollars just in that five six month period head-to-head -head. so it's something that Littleton needs to look into and uh, you know I, I would love to have a conversation with you someday Mr. Gorsett about where these nonsensical numbers came from that you sent to New Hampshire DES and in essence stab Bethlehem in the back relative to the stage six permit because those numbers don't make any sense. 
Their infrastructure is already there. All the, all the trucks have to do is go to success, which is further. But I'd be curious too to find out what your tipping fees are because Dalton was paying $97 a ton for demo and it's only $57 at Mount Carberry and success. So I think that's what the committee should be looking at. You're yeah, welcome to that conversation. Um, I would say that the numbers that we have were built on actual numbers that, that we experience uh, from everything from our biosolids contract to uh, our trucking fees and uh, anticipated tipping fees. So they're all, they're all based on uh, the science or the math that we have um, for, for the for the letter reset. But I, I, I'd love to show you that and see if you guys have got some, uh, some good insight and ways to shave it down. So. So, is it fair to say that we will um, look I, at the mission? Um, yeah, I don't know if we want to wait till after, you know, if this petition article has been submitted, does it make sense to do that now or form it after town meeting? You know, because that may very well um, change the mission or um, require the mission to be changed once the, the vote of the people. So, it may be prudent just to wait till after town meeting um, and then look at form the so we will just table that for now. Mm -hmm. So may I ask you how did this petition more of our What did you say, Pat? It'll, 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 it'll go on. It'll go on. It'll go on. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. I assume that had more than 25. Okay, so yeah. it's and they're all registered voters, yeah. so it's it's yeah. So once it's once it's been uh, counted, it's yeah, it's on no matter whether or not we want. It, so that's. Can I just say one thing? Uh, just to be upfront about everything, the Little Bit Conservation Commission is waiting on this for the letter to the DES specifically addressing the wetlands issue that this will have a big impact on. Um, I see no problem with making town boundaries be a barrier to something as basic as the Conservation Commission's mission to protect wetlands where one Conservation Commission can't sympathize and sympathize with another Conservation Commission. The letter will specifically avoid anything that has to do with economic type factors like truck traffic. Although I can't imagine when you do the total way one against the other, that even if it costs a little more to tip that garbage off that truck, setting up success, what's it going to cost if you've got those hundred trucks of stinking garbage coming up your Main Street, your totally tourist uh, impacted Main Street a day? That's you can't hardly put a value on that. So I'm sure that would be something that a committee would consider, but I do want everyone to know that a letter will go to the DES from the Local Conservation Commission opposing the White Man's application for this landfill. <laughs> and in fact, I mean, Bruce is right to a point, but this piece of land that, that Mr. Anderson owns, actually a piece of it is in the the same piece comes around the corner, comes over up on the back side of Main's Hill, the whole Hatchbrook watershed. Again, I know it's difficult to keep up with all these issues that are going on, but I can't stress enough the importance of getting out of the chair and going out to the area and looking at what's going on. Because without doing that, the decision that gets made is an incomplete decision. Uh, the other one, he mentioned that there were the ambulance to Griffith. There's two ambulance to Griffith in the North Country. Did you know that? Did you know that? There's an ambulance, you know, that's down below. But there's an ambulance to Griffith that comes in from Brooklyn. This is the name of the ambulance to Griffith. You got one that comes down here with the ambulance to Griffith. So when you're specifying something, you need to be able to tell where it is or what it is. You can't just leave it open. Well, I think it's pretty obvious. Okay, so the next we're talking about a $2.4 million project of this beautiful building. 
with the jack overlooking the Amanusic River. That's the heart of the river district, and it should be the second landfill upstream of this river. So the next um, topic is the general assessing services, the RFP. Uh, for assessing proposals, uh, I created an employee panel to review previous contract and update requests for proposals. In this case, it was an employee. It was employees who regularly deal with assessing doing a uh, Navy. Uh, this is our second time doing it this way. Uh, the last contract was solicited in 2015, and the results paid uh, state taxpayers about $225,000 over the five-year period. Um, and also, uh, in addition to the change of the statistical. Uh, Revaluation we saved about another seventy-five thousand dollars for the revaluation. Um, so the uh, RFP was reviewed by the select board and approved as meeting on October nineteenth, uh, both in twenty fifteen and now in twenty twenty. The RFP was sent to all certified assessment firms uh, that are listed on the New Hampshire Department of Revenue website, as well as published in the town website, New Hampshire Municipal Association classifies, and the Vermont League of Cities and Towns and Town classifies. Uh, unfortunately, we only received one response. Um, I say unfortunately just because you don't get a good, broad look at the market. Uh, but it is our current contractor who uh, meets the uh, supply. Uh, so, really, just uh, take a look and consider a new motion. We actually were able to reduce the next year's budget in assessing based on these figures that we received from them. Uh, we've actually increased the amount of time that's dedicated to the office uh, and to get more service is, I think, a pretty good value. Did you guys have any questions? It, 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 it just to be clear, this is the non-assessing process. Uh, this contract is different than the last one. The last one included uh, five years of general assessing services. Uh, and this is the first time we've actually done the general assessing services. Uh, and this is the first time we've actually done the general assessing services. And then four years of uh, data collection. Uh, and then the last year, uh, which is this year was the revaluation, and so what we did was we took the uh, the, the revaluation portion out, and the statistical uh, four-year data collection out. So what this is general services and pickups. So they're going to be just uh, doing the day-to-day -day assessing, monitoring new construction, uh, permits, you know, uh, current use. It's just the general assessing services. And then what do we mean by that? So at that point, we would want to go out to bid specifically for that. And at that time, the board could make a determination um, if you want to do a statistical uh, analysis, which is cheaper, or you can do a full rebound. Um, typically, those are going to run in between. A statistical is going to be 60, uh, maybe it's about 60 grand. A uh, full rebound is going to be about 150 uh, grand plus or minus. And we, we also anticipate starting to put money away each year towards that. You know, typically, you're trying to do it every five years unless your uh, sales ratio or coefficient of dispersion gets to be too great. And that's when usually the DRA steps in and says, time to go, time to do a uh, rebound. And the RFP was sent to all the companies that are on this list? Yes. Yep. And we only received one that. That's right. I think at this point, it looks like the, you know, the current contractor is Pretty much solidifying the area, so uh, I think other firms know that you know, it, it, there's economies of scale, and for them to send a uh, you know a crew up this far without having other accounts would probably uh, be fairly expensive. Yeah. So you're looking for a motion to direct you, uh, town manager, to work with the bidder on the execution of the final contract for the new design. Yeah. Okay. I'll make that motion. Roger, do you have questions? Or? It's our only choice. <laughs> well, we could, I mean, there's always, we always put the option in there. We can reject all bids and go back out to bid. One of the difficult things with that, I would just need to negotiate a month to month because the contract, our five year contract expires on December 31st of this year. It just seems to me like there's been a lot of jumbling of figures in the last three or four years to where all of a sudden the value of the town is up $100 million from what it was. Um, so, like, the only property 
couple years ago? Did the back end jump it that much? Yeah. That's a good question. Uh, yeah, so I think this year alone, I think we want to probably about $150 million. Uh, dollars. In fact, you know, something interesting with that is if you look at your updated budget sheet, um, our previous calculations were based on previous year's assessment. And that reduces next year the, the proposed budget in more articles. Uh, it's reducing our tax rate by 75 cents um, and the default about 95 cents. So over the past five years, really, I think what you've seen is the, the constant, uh, the consistent decline in the tax rate, while at the same time you're seeing a consistent increase in the property valuations. Um, I think the first assessment, first revaluation uh, we saw was a market move in a lot of residential property, commercial and industrial, pretty much were staying the same. What we saw in this last evaluation was really residential moving up, but then also industrial and commercial, uh, so really uh, significantly um, increasing. You know, and I, if the, it's, it's, it's very, uh, assessing is complicated, and it's really driven by the um, uh, McGinty Park Revenues Blue Book, which is their codes and rules, which is that is driven by the um, RSA. And so the assessors are held to a, a pretty high standard as far as how they calculate out values, value shifts, and value changes. Um, so, you know, I wouldn't call it uh, budging other numbers. One of the things that's just really is a, a historical, and always a historical look back of sales over the past year to maybe three um, of, of sales in the community or the area if there's not enough sales in the community itself. Um, but it, the, the increase has been very consistent. With the exception of the year that we did the uh, Great River Hydro Pilot, uh, the Great River Hydro Pilot actually moved about, I'd say, it was somewhere between 162 and 170 million dollars off of the uh, town's assessed value and then exchanged it for a raw cash payment. You remember the controversy over that? Yeah. It was a school statute that the town took down. What that did is really was solidify about 25% of the town's tax rate. It's going to be a constant uh, for a period of years. But even with that, and I think if you know, we hadn't done that deal, we'd probably be you know, looking for, if you remember, we talked about the goal of being a billion dollar community. If we want to get that you know, billion dollars, we're really creating a, a really solid base of the tax rate. You know, and maybe to Bruce's comments earlier, um, I think we've made a good strides in previous years. This year, really taking longer looks at balancing the valuation with expenses. Uh, you can see that in the tax rate. You know, so the consistent decline over the past four years. So, um, anyways, so yeah, it, it's tough to, to wrap your mind around how they work, but you know, unfortunately, it's Maybe it's too confusing. The state should come up with a better way, but it's the method they've created. So, so we do have a motion um, so for our directing the town manager to work with the bidder on execution of a final contract for the BOS to sign. Um, that motion is on the floor. Is that a five-year contract again? It is. several years was um, the potential to uh, actually, because Littleton is so big, and, you know, Carrie Car brings it up often, like we're actually kind of a city and town's clothing, really, and uh, was that we have enough demand that we could potentially hire a full-time assessor, and they would be a town employee. And I've had preliminary discussions with some of the surrounding communities about um, doing what we do with our town prosecutor and offering their services to surrounding towns to help alleviate some of the costs uh, to the local taxpayers. You know, that will take more planning than time that we have right now. Um, but, you know, it's definitely, would, I think it would be cost effective for the, uh, for the taxpayers to look at that down the road. Um, Five years is a long time. We've got time to look at that. And, you know, in the next year, it'll be something with five year contract. It's and, you know, something we could do, too, is look at, um, the potential for notification and exit clauses so that the contract could be reduced if if we're able to come up with a plan before the end of the five-year contract to potentially move in that direction. But, but this is going to be done by the end of this month. A couple more days. It, 
they've been they've been uh, open to us to do uh, month to month if we needed to. So uh, I know that they would rather have something solidified. But I do think it's a good deal, but um, would it cost us longer than, uh, or more in the long run to go month to month until? We, we hadn't talked terms, so I'm not exactly sure what the difference would be. Uh, you could direct me and sure there's an clause, <laughs> if you wanted to. But, oh, uh, direct, so the motion, request a motion is to finalize a contract with the uh, bidder. Um, as part of that contract, you could stipulate uh, a um, desire to have or direct me to make sure that there's a uh, exit clause that benefits the town should we want it in the contract early. A lot of times, like for example, our contract, one of the biggest contracts we have is with uh, utility partners, which is you know around 450 grand a year. Uh, that contract has a notification period uh, at the end of each year where we can notify them uh, of a desire to exit if need be. So we can look at that kind of approach. To, so can we figure out how, I guess if we just extend this for another month, what we would pay uh, to see if we can come up with a better plan and if we can just figure this out a little bit more. I guess the question is in there. Change your motion, Chad, or stick with. I mean, do you guys? I mean, if you guys don't want to second the motion, do you want me to withdraw the motion? Do you want to? Uh, you want me to amend it for next? Or do you want? No, to I just want to second it. She might want to second it. I don't know. I guess it's what, what you guys' uh, flavor is. If you want to direct Andrew to go into a one-year contract versus five, do you want to? You know, so look at that. Yeah. If you look at month to month, we could. Well, the last time we did the five, or Andrew uh, put the five-year contract together, it actually saved the taxpayers over two hundred twenty-five thousand dollars during that five-year period. Um, in addition to savings on the cyclical statistical reevaluation, which saved another seventy-five thousand. Uh, I think the fact that I mean, I guess it's a double-edged sword. On one hand, they're very familiar with our properties, so it probably that's a very good thing. On the other hand, we don't want them to think that they're the only choice for us, too. I don't think they know that there's only one bid. Okay. I didn't notify them. Maybe they'll watch this video, though. I mean, I don't know if they're familiar with that properties. Nobody's ever came to my house. No. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um. So you're thinking there's more drive-bys. Yeah. 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 I just know that the tax burden on some of the older people in Bolton right now is not good because of the way things have gone up. That maybe we need to, you know, to look into things and see if we can help them out some. And I was talking to a guy this morning that's got to take out a loan to pay his taxes. He's worked for Bolton all his life. And, um, he's got a nice house because he keeps it up himself. And it's just it's a tough situation to be in as a select person trying to answer your question. On the side note, too, something else that we could do is just look at the, um, look in that situation, is look at the um, tax credits and tax, uh, there's credits and, what's the other one? Do you remember? There's two things that you can do. Uh, you know, there's one for income, there's elderly, uh, and then there's different levels. And just make sure that the voters have had a chance to uh, take a look at all available options. Because uh, there, there may be additional tax credits or discounts that the voters could authorize um, to help. Um, something else too is there's a state, a lot of people don't know this, is there is a state uh, thing called the DP8 form, and that allows people who are under a certain income to file that, and the state will actually kick in a portion of their property taxes to help alleviate the burden. But we can do that in addition to just look and see what other potential authorizations the voters may want to consider telling. Would it make sense to 
I mean, would they do this and even really reduce their contract? Or, you know, and I know it's a cyclical thing, but mm -hmm. we've always gone with five-year contracts, but would it make sense to maybe do a two-year contract? Yeah, I think we could really, really uh, try to dictate whatever we like. We could do it two year with uh, new buildings, or just in case nothing happens, we can build into it uh, renewal. Mm -hmm. so, in fact, I think the last contract that ended in 2016 was with uh, MRI, and that one, from what I understand, was on basically auto renewal since maybe early 2000s. So. so Change the motion to a short. So we uh, have it for a two year with possible renewals um, and uh, built in escape clause. Yeah. I'll second that. Okay. All in favor say aye. 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 Good. So two year renewal, escape clause, and re uh, renewal. Yes. Right. So the only other thing we have left, I believe, is just public comments. And hearing none, are we going into... Um, oh, yes, we should. We got the Walter public? update. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right, and it would be under um, the RSA... Let me just see here. Let's see. Uh, so the RSA 91A32D. Yep. I'll make that motion, uh, Chad Stearns. Okay. I'll second it, Roger Emerson. Okay, Carrie Jenner. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Good. So we will go into non public. Do you want to please Adam and I just take care of the equipment before we go into the Sure. Yeah. Yeah.